Hello, everybody. It's Evan Grant from the Dallas Morning News, DallasNews.com, your Rangers insider. I come across like a used car salesman every time I feel like I introduce myself talking into the little picture box here. Um, coming from the, lot of the house in Surprise, Arizona. Beautiful art on the wall. It's about all we can show you with this with this camera since it's fixed to my little laptop. Uh, anyway, um, we are at about the midpoint of spring training. There are about three weeks left to go to the regular season. Team has been in Arizona three weeks, hence the midpoint. And it's a weird camp. I'm, I'm going to tell you, it, it, it's a weird camp in this way. Um, my sense is that this whole season is about starting pitching for the Rangers. Really, none of the starting pitchers are pitching in games right now. It doesn't seem like that big a deal. And there's not a ton of roster decisions to be made. All of this is um, – and, and the bottom line is that all of this should be normal. It should be usual. Um, a team should be able to say that uh, it's being cautious with starting pitchers uh, in spring training and be confident that they're going to be ready for the start of the season. It should have its roster pretty fairly set going into spring training because about the worst thing you can do is have to make decisions significant decisions based on spring training and and the signings of Robbie Grossman and Will Smith to major league contracts, I think all, but, but solidified about 25 of the 26 roster spots pending uh, barring injury. And of course, now there is one to Leody Tavares. We'll get into that in a minute. Uh, so here's my take on, on the starting pitching in the, in, in this camp. Yes. Jacob deGrom is yet pitching a game. As I tape this on Wednesday morning, uh, he's supposed to throw a lot of batting practice today, which I think, I think, will be the last hurdle before he he faces hitters. I don't know if that'll be in an A game. Don't know if it'll be in a B game. Don't know what the next step is. Um, John Gray is scheduled to start after being scratched from his last start. Nathan Uvalde is not pitching right now, uh, but again, he was preparing for a heavier than normal workload at the outset of spring for the W for the world baseball classic before an insurance issue kind of scuttled that possibility. And so they feel like taking five days off from throwing is not going to set him back significantly. Uh, I think the biggest issue is, is that Jake Odorizzi is, is, is not throwing, but here's the deal. Jake Odorizzi was not going to be in the rotation. Um, Chris Young made it very clear the other day that the Rangers hope, they have their five guys already in in order. Odorizzi was going to be, in all likelihood, asked to pitch in long relief and be a spot starter. Uh, and so they can they can certainly withstand that kind of situation early in the season. Um, so on, on the pitching front, it feels like the big story of camp has yet to develop. Uh, I don't feel like the Rangers are overly concerned. Uh, I think fan base is because you've had 51 years of being conditioned to, oh my God, what's the deal with Rangers starting pitching? I've only been around for 27 of them. And believe me, I'm tired of answering the question because I run out of things to say. Uh, I, 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 and I also, when people come up to me and ask me about the pitching and ask me about the, this team, the thing I keep coming back to is when you look at guys who have performed well this spring, particularly Cole Reagans, who I think has been the pitching star of the spring, um, it certainly seems like the Rangers have more depth at starting pitching than they've had in a long time. I, I, I think the best teams go to spring training with an idea of eight to 10 pitchers in their organization uh, that they feel are going to be capable of pitching in the big leagues in the starting rotation over the course of the year. You, you need more of a pitching pool um, than you do a pitching rotation. And when I look at this Rangers organization right now, I look at the five starters, DeGrom, Heaney, Uvalde, Perez, Gray. And then I start looking at the other options. We've mentioned Odorizzi, who I think is going to be ready shortly after the start of the season, if not on opening day. 
Cole Reagans, who has certainly moved himself up in the pecking order uh, by by coming to spring, but coming to spring, coming to spring with an improved fastball, um, and just looking. He looks determined. He's got a good look about him, is an old school baseball saying. Bruce Bochy has has said that on several occasions. Dane Dunning um, was basically squeezed out of the rotation with the signings this year, but he's the kind of guy who fits in a rotation as, you know, a, a, a number five starter, um, maybe even a number four starter on, on the top end. And that's a great kind of guy to have as a depth option. Uh, and then you get into guys like Glenn Otto. Uh, and potentially you would like to see Cole Wynn step up after last year. Uh, you get there, you're you're at 10. That's that's legitimate. Um, and it, it, it gives you the ability to withstand an injury or two. So I, I think the starting pitching is in pretty good shape. That's all I've got to say about that. Let's talk about Leody Tavares in center field. For a minute, uh, strained oblique muscle. Uh, he's going to miss about two weeks at a minimum. I think um, the Rangers said when this happened on Monday that they would wait seven to ten days and reevaluate. I anticipate, based on my history of covering guys with oblique muscles, that uh, well, everybody has an oblique muscle. They actually have two, but my history of covering guys with oblique strains uh, suggests uh, it's a tricky injury. You start to feel better, but you're not swinging full, full strength. And when you do swing full strength, it's, it's entirely possible. You can aggravate that the first time. So you've got to be super cautious with it and maybe even rest it a little bit longer than you think you've got to. Uh, and, and given, given the Rangers aspirations this year and the need to get off to a fast start, I think you want to have your best your best 26 to win games at the start. And and Leody catching up on March 30, 30, 30th, 30th, yeah, March 30th, um, I don't think is ideal. I think the Rangers have some guys who are short-term answers. Bubba Thompson, who homered on, on Tuesday, um, certainly is a big league is big league ready to contribute in a role that I think will be expanded this year with uh, his speed and his, his defense. He may even profile as a fourth outfielder long-term. Um, so he could certainly step in and play center field defensively for a week, two weeks. He's a right-handed hitter. You've got Travis Jankowski here in camp as a non-roster player. He's a left-handed hitter who offers a lot of the same – attributes that, that Thompson does plus speed not not to the Bubba's level but plus speed and, and above average defense uh in center field and so you could potentially set up a platoon with the two of them for the first two weeks let Bubba face left-handed pitching let let Jankowski face right-handed pitching there's some roster uh issues that go along with that because you'd have to find spot on the 40-man roster for for Jankowski he's a non-roster player and right now I don't feel like there's a lot of fat on the 40 man roster. So the Rangers would face some decisions there. Um, the other possibility would be, you know, I think of the two of these two non-roster outfielders that have a legitimate shot to make the team, Jankowski and Clint Frazier. Frazier's got the more pronounced upside tool. He's got power and his bat, his bat speed is quick. He's not a center fielder. Uh, you would have to go with a less than ideal outfield alignment to start the year um, if you decided to keep Frazier, but you could put Frazier in right field. Um, don't know how well his defense would play out there long term. But again, if you've got Bubba Thompson on your bench, you can put Thompson in the game in the sixth inning if you've got a lead uh, to protect that. Uh, you put Frazier in uh, right field and you move Adolis Garcia over to center field. I would not want Adolis Garcia playing center field long term, mostly because he's such a high um, effort player. Uh, and I, I think that as little body fat as he cover, carries, uh, he, he's he's the kind of guy who would be more prone to a soft injury tissue, uh, soft injury, soft tissue 
injury, soft tissue injury. Listen, they talk, they say the back and the knees are the first thing to go when you get old. Uh, here at 57, and I feel ancient, um, I've found that the ability to speak has really started to evade me, elude me. See, there, I have it happen again. I love how I break down the fourth wall here and just speak directly to you. Feels like we have we have a certain rapport, doesn't it? I don't know. Hopefully you feel that way. Uh, anyway, so I don't know that I'd want Adolis Garcia playing center field long term, but it, I think in this situation, you'd be talking about a week, 10 days max. The Rangers have some off days early in the year. So I think you could make sure that he stays fresh. Uh, and if you needed to start Thompson in center um, one day, you could do that. So um, those are the two options I think the Rangers will consider uh, over the, the the remainder of spring training while they try and get a better feel for, for Tavares' situation. But again, I feel like both these guys, Jankowski and, 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 and Frazier, um, have something that they can offer. It, it may be a very specific set of tools, and they may have uh, shortcomings in in other areas of the game, but I think they've got – let me get this uh, little bit of – well, there. I just made more glare in the back of my head. Think of it as ideas exploding from my head. Um, I, I feel like they've got something they can offer, even if it's a more specific set of tools in a, in a, in a narrow um, lane. But you're not talking about a guy that you're expecting to start 110 games. You're asking a guy to maybe start two weeks. So – um, other stories, you know, Evan Carter has performed great here in the first three weeks of spring. Uh, there has been some talk on my social media feeds about why not give Evan Carter a chance in center field? Well, he's 20 years old. He's played about a month above class. A. Uh, those are reasons enough. Other reasons are he's not on the 40 man roster. And again, you'd have to start his his service time and option clock to put him on the roster essentially for what you would probably think would be two or three weeks. Um, I also don't think that you can do enough in spring training to make these kind of like permanent uh, career marker decisions. I, I think that it makes sense to let Evan go to double A, uh, start the season there, continue to hopefully excel the way he did last year. He's got a great ability to command the strike zone. Uh, he's got great discipline, great defensive abilities and speed. Uh, he's been a real pleasure to watch. And it's it, it's been what has stood out for me about the number of kids in this camp early. And maybe part of it is a product of how high the Rangers have drafted the last few years. Um, but the kids who were in camp, for the early portion, guys like Leiter and Rocker, Evan Carter, Justin Foscue, Leiter, Carter, Foscue, Leiter, Rocker, Foscue have all been sent to the minor league camp now, as was kind of expected. Um, but Evan Carter, uh, Chase Lee, who's here um, as a reliever, Mark Church, who's here as a reliever. It just feels like the kids – who are playing late in games um, as part of their first or second spring training camps without a real shot at, at making the big league roster are just better than what the Rangers have, have run out there from the minor league side the last few years. Uh, it feels like they're more competitive. It feels like these are guys, I don't want to say showing off, but it feels like they're showing out in these games, late in games. Uh, they're, they're, you know, I don't know how many at bats Evan Carter has had against, legitimate big league pitching, but against either fringe big league pitching or more advanced minor leaguers that he's faced in, in spring training, he's certainly uh, shown himself to be more than capable against those guys. So, you know, I, I think if I'm summing up where we're at here on, on a bunch of stuff is the pitching depth seems legitimate. The roster seems more stable and able to withhold withstand the injury that has arisen. Maybe that's because Tavares isn't as advanced 
uh, offensively as as you would like at this point. Um, but I think that you you can get close to what he was producing at the end of last year from however you go to start the year uh, with the hope that Leody this year really takes a step forward. And I think that the prospects who have appeared in camp have been brighter than what the Rangers have, have shown over the last th- three years. It appears to me from three weeks in February and March that the organization is on its way back to health, right? If I was, if I was um, giving you a state of the organization, I would say that it feels like this organization feels healthier than it has been uh, in a while. I think the Rangers took the right approach this winter. They didn't trade any young prospects, so they've continued to hold on to prospects. Um, and they supplemented the talent holes that they needed to supplement with free agent investments. And so that, you know, as long as an owner is willing to invest that kind of money, that's the best way to get your organization back to a healthy a healthy spot with the ability to potentially sustain that long term. So um that's my that's my prescription. Or my diagnosis, actually, I don't have a prescription for it. It's my diagnosis. Three weeks into into spring training, um, I think other things that that stand out to me. Maybe again, it's it, you cover baseball long enough, and and you understand some of the cycles of regime change. And you know when when a manager is fired, uh, as Chris Woodward was last year, um, there was talk that that um, meetings ran too long and, uh, you know, all the quote unquote flaws were, were made public, whether that, again, whether that's real or perceived, I, I feel like it's always somewhere in the middle. I think, you know, the Rangers, when the Rangers hired Chris Woodward, it was to get everybody involved, to talk more, to be more egalitarian. There was a thought that at the end, Jeff Bannister's tenure as manager was too, oppressive, too heavy, um, didn't listen to people. So you go the other way. Now the the swing with, with Bruce Bucci has been back towards less meetings, more on field, um, uh, giving, delegating and um, uh, allowing coaches to do their, their work more. And so that narrative was, that was the narrative that was created um, when the firing took place or when the hiring of Bochi took place. Uh, and I, you know, I think everything here in spring has certainly looked like that's been the case. Uh, I have no doubts about Bruce Bochi's ability to manage a big league club. I have no doubts about all the elements that people have indicated to me are real strengths of his uh, when it comes to dealing with personnel. We're not talking about managing games and X's and O's really right now. That, that'll show up in the regular season. Um, but I've just watched interactions and, you know, in, in interactions with the media, Boach doesn't, um, I wouldn't, I, he's very pleasant. I, I, I would say he's not effusive about a bunch of stuff. Um, and so you wonder how that carries over with players, but I've watched him just pull players aside, uh, have one-on-one conversations with them. And again, I'm reminded of my personal interactions with players that I or former players of Bochy's that I spoke to about how he relates to players. And so what I was told overall was these one on one conversations that he has with players, which other managers have with their players. There's a way that he has of communicating directly, um, but also uh, in a manner that makes a player feel important in the moment. And, and that's just. That's just the mark of a good communicator, a good manager, whether it's a baseball manager or a manager in your in your office, right? Uh, you want a guy who can com- you want a, a, a man or woman who can communicate to you directly, honestly, but also make you feel important to the larger team pro- uh, element. So um, that's what it appears to me. Uh, we will see where everything goes from here, but. As we sit here on March 8th with all these people looking over my shoulder, it feels like the Rangers are 
about where they need to be. I, I don't think you should be terribly uh, concerned about the starting rotation issues at this point. I don't think that the Leody Tavares injury um, is uh, by any chance a, a critical injury to the club. And I think that, that the mood here seems to be exactly what the Rangers wanted it to be. So that's been it from here. Uh, now to my favorite stuff. The best thing I ate this week. Uh, and I am uh, sending a photo to the office right now of uh, some radiatory that I had at a place in, in Scottsdale. And I get this question a lot from people about where do you eat in, in Surprise? Where's a good place to take my family when I'm uh, when I'm in Surprise if I come to spring training? Well, the answer for me is that there's not a, a, a number of great places in Surprise. Um, there is a, a Vietnamese restaurant named Saigon Kitchen that has been here for a long time. Um, that is a favorite of, of Rangers personnel. It, it's good. There is a uh, there's a sushi place that again I think is just oh it, it's fine. It's nothing special uh, named uh, Ugly Sushi, um, but it's it's real close to the ballpark, and so players and personnel go there uh, as well as, as 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 I do. But in terms of other restaurants. Um, there's not just just not a great uh, variety of uh, mom and pop or or small restaurateur operate chef operators in in this area. It, it's Atlanta chains. But when we do go over to the other side of the valley to Scottsdale, um, as the Rangers did earlier this week to play the Rockies, and they are headed back today. Wednesday. I don't know why this is today. Um, we can actually go out and find some nice restaurants there. I had dinner with a, a friend from Dallas uh, who now lives out here on Monday night at a place called the Fat Ox uh, in Scottsdale. Great Italian food. Um, I got there a little bit early and I was sitting at the bar waiting for him to show up. And the people next to me were ordering just off their little happy hour menu. And one, uh, they they did a magnificent job of ordering, but one item after another just came out looking spectacular. Anyway, when we sat down, my friend started ordering. Um, uh, they had a great shrimp appetizer uh, that was almost like an Italian shrimp cocktail, Calabrian spiced shrimp served chilled. Uh, just, I thought, magnificent. But for me, always a star at an Italian restaurant is pasta. Uh, and when you get to a place where the pasta is both fresh and cooked, particularly al dente, um, and you get some variety in the shapes of pasta, you uh, you get something special. And uh, at Fat Ox, they have a nice selection of, of unique pasta shapes. Uh, we had some garganelli, which is kind of a uh it's, it's I, look it up i'm sorry or maybe maybe super producer demetria will flash a picture of uh, a garganelli up here um all i can think of is the uh, gargamel from smurfs but it doesn't look like that and some radiatory um which is a uh kind of a spiral um uh shape uh, it's also a family favorite for a number of reasons, but it was really simply done with some with some uh, San Marzano tomatoes uh, and uh, some olive oil. But it was firm. Sauce was creamy, acidic, uh, without being uh, overly spicy. I like spice, but you don't always have to have spice. Uh, it was just. Just a simple pasta done well. And from my two very, two brief trips to Italy, if there's one thing I've learned to really appreciate, it's that the best pastas can be the, the, the simplest. And so with that, I will close it out on the flat ox. But if you get a chance, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, really enjoyed our meal there. Um, I don't think you can go wrong with just about anything. Uh, we also had some uh, uh, some branzino, some meatballs, and uh, a terrific salad 
that um, had pomegranates and uh, uh, a little bit of pancetta in it. Um, I believe some gorgonzola. Uh, it was just just a lot of different flavors popping, and, and there was crunch to it. It was really good. So anyway, uh, that's Italian food with Evan, my version of Finding Italy. Call me your personal Stanley Tucci. Um, anyway, we will be back next week uh, with more video. I will, again, talk awkwardly to you um, about the Rangers and food and anything else you want to talk about. In the meantime, folks, everybody, so long. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week. video.